impact right here in our community. That's it for your morning video announcements. Now it is. All right. Um, hey, do you ever notice how when uh, in any kind of organization, any kind of, uh, you know, when, when it's been around long enough, everything kind of drifts towards being more complicated, uh, no matter what it is. Uh, you got an organization, you get people involved, and it lasts for a, a, any amount of time. It, it just becomes more complex, more complicated, more difficult. I mean, you look at anything. I mean, look at our laws, our government, uh, even in the church, this kind of thing happens. And so uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, our spiritual life, this kind of thing happens. And so uh, we want to be aware of that. We want to, in this series that we're to, uh, in now, I, we want to just kind of uh, simplify uh, what we believe, simplify uh, what Jesus is trying to do in our life so we don't get kind of carried into the complexities and lose what we're, we're all about. So here's, here's the, the, the reality is that transformation is possible in our lives, but it is not automatic. It, it's not inevitable, okay? But, I mean, it's what Jesus wants to do, but it's not inevitable, okay? So, I, and I think one of the challenges for us in Western Christianity is we will settle we will settle for way too little than what God has planned. And so in a church, we settle for uh, activities. We settle for programs. We settle for ministry. Uh, we settle for, uh, man, a uh, worship style of songs that I really like. We settle for a preacher that I, I really like. But we don't really consider, is my life reflecting the life of Jesus. Does my life reflect that? Is that, um, does that? is that part of my life? Is my life changing? Is there transformation happening in my life? Because transformation is what Jesus wants to do in our life. So uh, a transformation in the New Testament we see is, is pretty radical, um, and it's more than just religious activity. So in the series that we're in, how, how, do, we, how do we do this? What we're going to focus on today is the become part. Uh, this the, We talked last week about being with and in the presence and all of that. Today is going to be this become. And the idea uh, is just that, hey, let's be simple. Let's be clear about what it is that we're about. Let's, let's re-look in the beginning of the year. Let's look at our values. Let's, let's look at uh, the core of who we are. Let's look at what our culture should be. And let's make sure we're on the right path together. So that's the, the idea uh, in, in this series. Jesus' invitation to us is to be disciples. He calls us to be disciples. Now, the word disciple in the New Testament is, is uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the word disciples in there 268 times. In fact, they, they only use Christi uh, Christians. It's only in there three times, and it's, and it's usually negative connotation associated with it. So um, we talked last week that disciple, when we think about disciple, it means a learner. It means student. And so we kind of picture in the West, I'm sitting down at a desk, and I'm listening to somebody give a lecture, and I'm taking some notes. And I'm trying to learn some stuff. And we said, really, in Jesus' day, that's not what it was about. It was following the rabbi. It was actually being in his footsteps. It was doing life together. And so uh, we used a word that maybe is a little bit better, uh, apprentices of Jesus. So that's the idea is we want to be an apprentice of Jesus. And so we use the in and out burger menu, that simplicity and that clarity. We said, that's kind of how we want to bring our Christianity and, and, and the, the, the words we're using and kind of explain, hey, that is what we're doing. Let's not be so complex. Let's not be so complicated. And so we broke it down to this, be with Jesus. That's the intimacy part. That's the presence. That's knowing God. Okay, so know God. And then, the, then we've got uh, become like him. Number two, we want to become like Jesus. And then number three, we want to do it for the sake of the world. We are on a mission. We want to, he's called us to make a difference. <clears throat> so we've got those, those three things, and that's what we want our, to be organized around. And we don't want to let those things slip. We don't want to get uh, uh, busy with activity that would preclude those kind of things happening. So we see this in the scripture, throughout scripture. We looked uh, last week at, at Matthew 4. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, Matthew 4 um, is, uh, 
Now, there we go. I don't know why that's on there twice, but here we go. Um, I, I, so there's, there's where we are, the, the, the three things. Being, okay, wow, and I'm way ahead now. Okay, so here's what Jesus said, all right? Matthew 4. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So follow me. We see that. That's the be with part. Okay, the, the be with, the intimacy part, which is, of course, it starts when what? We surrender. We surrender our life. We ask Jesus into our heart. We ask him to be Lord of our life. Whatever that was for you, that's the surrender part. Uh, so for the first disciples that he goes to, what are they doing? They're holding their nets, and he says, drop your nets, come and follow me. And so that's what they do. But he doesn't just leave them there. He says, I will make you. I'll make you. So that's the become like Jesus part. That's a formation part that's happening that he wants us to participate with him in, in life. So that's, we, we've got that part, formation. And then he is going to not just leave us there, but there's a mission for us. He's going to make us fishers of men. Uh, you are going to live on mission. We are a sent people with a purpose. It's not just all about ourselves. So this is what the church is committed to to this kind of clarity. Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. We want to be with Jesus. We want to become like Jesus for the sake of the world. We want to make a difference, be difference makers. That's what he's called us to. Uh, he, so he calls them to leave their nets. That's what they were holding. So for you, what is it that Jesus is calling you to leave behind? What is it that you're holding on to as your source of identity, your source of purpose, your source of meaning that is outside of him? Is there something like that? He calls you to surrender, to come, drop all of that, and be with him. Good church attendance uh, and religious activities just aren't enough. That's not what he called us to. That, that's not going to transform our hearts. It's possible to participate in programs and never uh, participate in ministry even and never have our hearts transformed. Uh, so so uh, uh, apprenticeship is this. I'm going to say apprenticeship is a lifelong pursuit in community of being conformed to the image of Christ from the inside out. It will be expressed in our everyday life. So all three of these things work together. It's not just one over the other. We're, uh, they're working together. Uh, we are be uh, being with Jesus. That helps us in our becoming of Jesus becoming more like him. Uh, and again, it's not a guarantee that it happens. We've got to participate. Uh, and then that should propel us into mission. Again, simple menu for us. That's what it is. This is being uh, an apprentice, and that's our target as a follower of Jesus. Okay, so now uh, each of us, though, will have inclinations or, or personality types that are going to Help us to be more inclined towards one of those three things than, than uh, another one. Or maybe we're more inclined towards two of those three things than we are another one. And what happens is we, we get that, our, our wheel doesn't work. We get kind of like a flat tire and, and there could be some unhealthy things in that. We'll talk about more of that uh, uh, next week. But the reality is our target is to be an apprentice of Jesus. Remember that uh, discipleship, discipleship is not a, a Christian thing. We talked about this last week. It's a human thing. It's a human thing. So for us, what we have to do is what are we and who are we being discipled by? What, what are those things that are forming us? See, the evidence of that will be how you live your life out. That's how you'll, you'll know. So here's a, a good way to look at it. Who you, uh, what you do is important. That's important. But who you are becoming is even more important. One of the greatest gifts that we can give God is the person that we are becoming, the per come, becoming the person he's called us to. So we see this becoming all through the New Testament. I pulled out like five or six scriptures here. Uh, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man. We see that in Luke. Uh, in Hebrews, we grow in our relationship with God. In Galatians 5, we grow in the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit grow in us. In 1 Corinthians, uh, we are to uh, change our thinking from that of, of thinking like a child to thinking like an adult. Uh, in 2 Peter, we're to grow both in grace and in knowledge. In Ephesians 4, we grow together in community as a body, as a family. And it's just, I mean, there's a few. They're, they're all over the place in the New Testament. Jesus' goal isn't just to inform us, 
but it is to transform us. And we slip into, I just need a little bit more information. And that is not what it's about. And so that's what this series really is about. Um, it, uh, just That it's not just learning can be a big shift for a lot of us. It, it's not just sitting there, it's learning, but it's putting into practice. It's being like Jesus, allowing him to transform us. And so um, we're going to build off of this scripture here today in Luke chapter 6. Uh, he, he, he told them this parable, and by the way, this is the, the shortest parable that he tells. Uh, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. So he offers them both a warning and a promise, right? We got warning and promise right here in this little parable. When the blind lead the blind, it's going to be trouble and you're going to fall into a pit. He's saying, be careful who you're influenced by. Be careful of the things that you're influenced by. We need to be intentional in those things. We need to take a look at those things that are influencing us. The blind leading the blind is not going to lead us to a place that we want to go. It's going to be a bad place. But he also gives us this promise here. So we've got the promise. It's an invitation uh, not just to learn some things, not just to, to give intellectual assent to some things he said, but it's to, to become like your teacher. You can become like the teacher. Jesus is the rabbi. He's the teacher. We can become like him. Notice it says fully trained. So fully trained. So that, that implies that there's a, a part where you're partially changed. Trained. You're not all the way trained. In fact, I would submit to you, I don't know if there's ever a t time you get to fully trained. Uh, Paul says, I haven't gotten there yet. And, and uh, I strive to be there. And I think, man, if Paul hadn't gotten there yet, I probably got a little ways to go myself. So there's this idea, there's, there's a, a process that's, that's happening here. Um, it's a journey, a process. We just had one of the greatest football coaches uh, of all time just, just retired. And, and his big slogan, the thing he would always go is, he would tell his players, trust the process. Uh, Nick Saban with Alabama said, trust the process. So the idea is if these recruits would come in and they would trust the process and they'd stay with them for like four years, what's going to happen is at some point along that line, if they trust the process, they're probably going to win a national championship. And if you were there during his time for four years, you're going to, at some point in your time, going to win at least one national championship. Trust the process. And that's what this is about, trusting the process and being part of a process and recognizing our spiritual formation is a process. It is a journey. And so we want to surrender to that. And we want to recognize that's what's happening in our life. And we want to be participants in what God is doing uh, in our life. That's the becoming like him part of this. So uh, it, it's a full transformation. And it is available, um, but it is not, again, it, it, it is not inevitable. It's not automatic. Um, we are on this journey, um, but it's full surrender of our lives and everything. And then, by the way, the invitation is to everyone. The invitation Jesus gives, it doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter um, what, what you've come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It's, it doesn't matter what you've left undone. The invitation is to everyone. Everyone that you ever come eyeball to eyeball with. It's the John 10, the abundant life, here and now. Jesus promised in John 10.10. 10. He's, he's offering this abundant life. Um, and it's more than, hey, I just hope that one day I go to the good place and I don't go to the bad place. It's, it's, about, it's about peace and joy and abundance here and now. Relationship with God is what he's inviting you into. So becoming like Jesus is what we call spiritual formation. We are being formed, if, if we'll allow and participate in the process, let the process work. Trust the process and trust the one that's working the process. So, uh, so it's spiritual formation or sanctification. D.A. Carson says this, it's grace-driven effort. So grace is, is a free gift of God. I, I love that idea. It's grace-driven effort. Um, and, and I love that because it, it's grace first. It is that God has fully pursued us. Not that we've ever done anything to earn or to merit the favor of God. It's the grace of God's on us. But because of that grace, now we put some effort in. We, better word, partner with the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in our life. We get to partner with the work of God. 
That's what we talk about. Logan was talking about with the finances. That's what we talk about mission on the, on the earth. When we give towards mission, we give our finances, we give our time, we go on missions. We're partnering with the work that God is doing. So we partner, partnership with him. So I'm going to give us two um, definitions here. Justification, one, first one. Justification, you're probably familiar with that word. Um, but it, it, what a justification is, it's your positional holiness. We just sang about holiness. So we have a positional holiness with God. God sees us as the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So we have positional holiness. You are declared innocent the, the moment that you surrender to God. You might have said words like, be Lord of my life, forgive me of my sins. Whatever it is, God sees you are positionally holy before the Lord. It's the old adage, justified, never sin. Justified, never. Justified. You are justified in the eyes of Father because of what Jesus did. There's positional holiness. But then as we work this out, there's also this word sanctification. It, it, it's, it's what we call practical holiness. So that was positional holiness. So now there's practical holiness. Uh, and this is um, built and it's grown and it's developed over time. It's in our everyday lives. Being like Jesus and my marriage, with my kids, on the job, with finances, with my free time, I am being like Jesus. It's walking those things out. Here's a, a good definition of it. Struggling with it today. Sanctification, a state of proper functioning, setting something apart to be used as the designer atten- uh, intends. I love that, the designer intends. We have a designer. We have a designer, and we, we want to be used as he intended. He gives us the choice. We don't have to participate in the way he wants us to, but we get to. That's the, the, uh, the, the invitation that he's given us. Uh, that's what spiritual formation is. That's what spiritual formation does. Do you ever feel like, man, you're just ensnared by your sins? Do you feel like, man, I've just got some patterns from the past? God wants us to be free from those things. And as we, we walk in this practical holiness, he begins to work things out in our life. We're not meant to stay the same. A lot of us like Jesus, but we don't want to become like Jesus. Like, man, I appreciate the cross. I, I, I love the resurrection. Man, but <clears throat> I am not going to pray for my enemies. I, I, I don't want to do that. Man, I I don't want to live a life of sacrifice. Hey, I don't want to pray his will be done. I'm praying to him so he'll make my will be done. I mean, come on. I want him to see my side of things. That's what this is all about. Uh, There's there's just a real tension for us in that, hey, surrendering all of our life to him. And so what we do is we we play religious games sometimes uh, instead of just coming to him and being real. Uh, But what he's called us to is to become like him. I love the way Dallas Willard puts it. Spiritual formation or sanctification, is what are we talking about here, in the Christian tradition is a process of increasingly being possessed and permeated by the character traits of Jesus. As we walk in the easy yoke of discipleship with Jesus, our teacher. We talked last week about he's given, hey, take your yoke off and put mine on because it fits and I'm in it with you. So that, uh, being possessed, it's not admiration. I am possessed and permeated with the Spirit of God. And when you look at it like that, it's like, hey, on Sunday or, you know, on Thursday or whatever, at small group, I come and, and I think about God. It's, no, I am permeated. I am possessed by the Spirit of God everywhere I go in everything that I do. One of the best passages, I think, talks about this is in 2 Corinthians, uh, yeah, Paul, Paul's writing, and he says, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, that phrase transformed in the Greek is where we get our, our word metamorphosis, uh, metamorphosis, it's the metamorpho, it's the Greek word. And what's the, you know, the, the fifth grade science, it's the, the caterpillar that, that gets chained, goes into the cocoon, and then, I don't know, I forget, it's weeks or months or something later, it comes out of the cocoon, and it's not like, it's not like a slightly better caterpillar. 
It's a brand new creation. That's, I mean, it, it flies now. I mean, it's incredible. And so that's what the scripture says about it. It's radical transformation. Radical transformation in our life. That's what this is talking about. Uh, again, we're not talking about a slightly better caterpillar with some cool colors. We're talking about this thing flies. It flies now. Unbelievable. You used to just inch around, and now it flies, and it's beautiful. It's got these great wings and all of that. So, so that's what Paul's talking about with this transformation. This is the invitation, and this is what's offered to us to become like Jesus. We become like him more and more. Now, what I find interesting is that apparently reorienting our lives or fixing our focus is what he says in contemplating God's glory helps bring that about. In my life, it's one of the main ways that we are transformed. I begin to think the way Jesus thinks. I start to, to contemplate his glory. I think about those things. And so uh, that, that's one of the ways I'm, I'm transformed. Uh, this is why last week is so important. The idea, just be with. Be with in a setting like this. We have to be, but be with him uh, on, on our own. Just beholding him in his presence. Uh, because we become what we behold. We become what we behold. Uh, and that can be Jesus. That can be the stock market. That can be social media. Whatever you, you behold, we become like whatever it is that we behold. So he says, contemplate God. That's the beginning of transformation for us. Contemplate his glory. Uh, that's why I say transform, transformation, man, it is possible. It's what we're called to, but it's not automatic. We have to participate. And that's the really tricky part about this because I, I don't know, I, I think, especially in this room, a room like this, I think, man, we, yeah, I want to change. You're telling me this. I, I, I want transformation. I'm not really seeing it all that much. But here's, here's part of the reason. I don't know how. I, I don't even know where to begin to have this transformation. So that's what I want to really kind of finish up our talk with Today, you know, uh, Duke did a, uh, Duke University did a study, said almost 80% on some days, depending on what's happening in your day, 80% of your day is just, you know, it, it's just habits. It's just get almost just done without thinking. It's, it's just things we do, and because we've always done them, and that's the way we do it, it's just the way it goes. And not every single day is that, but, but up to 80% of your day can be just habits. So what it is, it's unintentional formation happens in our lives, and it just happens because we're human, okay? I mean, un unintentional formation is happening. It's just the way we, we've grown up, and it's the way things are, and it's the way we think. And so what happens is we make up stories. It's all, we, we make stories to kind of help us fit into our place in the world. We make big, big stories. We make up little stories. We have this narrative that we tell. And then also we have these relationships in our life, and, and it just becomes automatic. So well, we've got relations. You remember the old adage? It says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So it's kind of like that. Our relationships have an impact on the way that we view things, on the way that we see things, and then on just the way that we are formed, even unintentionally. So all of us, just by the sake, because we're human, we're formed unintentionally in so many ways. And so what we have to do is we've got to put in place some things to counteract just what happens in human nature. we got to have some, some counteraction things. And so we have to, because... We have to be intentional. We have to be intentional, right, in our, our human relationships. We know that. But we also have to be intentional in our relationship with God, in our spiritual formation, so that we can become more and more like Jesus. So uh, we, we, we've got these counter habits, or what we would call uh, uh, in spiritual formation, practices. We've got some practices to put in place, rhythms in our life that we can use to counteract just unintentional formation, kind of falling into a trap or just kind of drifting off in just any way without being intentional. And so we have teaching, part of what's going on here today, uh, uh, some of what we're doing here, but also we have reading the Word of God. Uh, just be, That's why we have our, our Bible reading plan every year. Just there's a steady idea of, hey, here's a plan and a purpose of me going through and on a daily basis being in God's word. Uh, because here, most of the world's stories are in direct conflict to God's story. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. But most of the world's stories are in conflict to that. And so we've got to do some counteractive things to counteract those stories that are being told to us all the time. And then we need to be intentional, again, with our relationships 
Uh, and that's why we, we love and promote and participate in small groups so that we can form some intentional gospel community. Gospel community is all about chasing after Jesus, regardless of our differences, no matter what it is. We, we have one thing in common, and that's Jesus. And we want to become, we want to be with him. We want to become like him for the sake of the world. And so that overarching vision or goal, that, that, uh, that, that, that takes care of everything else. No matter, you know, I like the Raiders or I like the Niners or, you know, like me, poor me, I like the Giants, you know. And so, you know, you just, it, it's, it's a hard, hard time for me. So you just, it, we're, we're dip, we can get together over um, the, uh, Jesus, okay. And so we want that gospel kind of community. And, and I think it starts here with, with uh, Romans 12, but it doesn't end there. He says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, and that's an important line right there, in view of God's mercy. Because if you skip that, that intimacy part, that grace that's been given to us, uh, it, it's in view of all of God's goodness, in view of all that God has done for me. You, stuff you never earned, you never merited, you didn't do, do anything to get it. In light of that, that you have that, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's saying, hey, there are patterns. There's patterns that the world wants you to buy into. There's patterns that the world wants you to fit into. It wants you to, to buy into these things. You, you may have felt that lately. Just, man, the world is helping me to fit into this, this pattern of things. And if you don't, you will feel ostracized. If you don't, you're going to be kind of shoved to the side. You're going to be a pariah because you, you don't fit in to what the world wants. The world has a pattern of how it wants you to spend your money, how it wants you to think about each other. I mean, man, if you have a different thought, well, then you know what? It's not that we just have different thoughts. You're the enemy. That, that's what the world would tell us now. It said the world would tell us you should draw lines. The world would say, you know, it's us versus them. That's what the world wants us to fit into. Uh, there's, there's just a, a pattern and Paul is saying, don't let that happen. Be aware. Be counteractive in all of this. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's something you participate in. You practice. Uh, and you have community that helps you with this. And it all happens over time. It doesn't happen like we come to the Lord and we say a prayer. We confess. You're my Lord. And boom. Uh, we, uh, we're positionally holy. But this kind of thing, becoming like him, it just happens over a lifetime. Here, spiritual formation is crockpot. It, it's not microwave. And you think about it, and I want microwave. I don't even like, I think microwave popcorn's too slow. I mean, that's, uh, I, I want fast. But spiritual formation just isn't that way. It just, it, it just, not, just not that way. Um, here's another thing God uses, and I hate this. Honestly, I didn't want to put it in here. But if you're going through God's word, you're going to do the full counsel of God's word, you got to put it in there. God uses suffering. He uses suffering in our life. Again, I don't like this at all. I, wanna, I want God to give me wisdom so that I can stay out of having to suffer over things. I want to give me wisdom. Let me see the, the roadblocks and so my, my way can be straight. But God uses them. God used him. James, the, the brother of Jesus, he says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. Which, that sentence alone, just to me, is insane. Of What do you mean, be, take joy in my trials? No, I'm praying that I don't have trials. I'm praying I don't want to have, but he's saying, take joy in those things. Why would I do that? Well, he tells you. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. There's a, a, the, the growth perspective there. We'll, we'll grow and we'll become complete, uh, mature and complete, not lacking anything. Again, we're there, there's growth that we participate in with God. In my experiences, we don't tend to, to deal with suffering really well. What we do, we, we tend to run to distractions. We tend to run to escapism or, or really uh, worse than that. Uh, because we don't want to deal with it. But James seems to be of the belief that in our sufferings, God does some of his greatest work in us if we will participate with him. Some of us know this. Some of you have been through some things. I know I've been through some things that I wouldn't wish 
on anybody. But then as I look back, as you look back, you say, you know what? I look, God did something in me that wouldn't have happened otherwise as I followed in his path, as I followed in that. So, so um, we're going to look at some things here. And so, so I hope that gets you thinking uh, about what am I going to do to counteract what the enemy and what the world want to do. So I, I want to kind of offer two suggestions. I've been doing a lot of reading over the break, and it gets dangerous when I do that. And so I got a couple things from the Puritans, believe it or not, that I think are going to be helpful. The first one is, here's the word, mortification. Mortification. Now, I, you probably know that's a, a great Christian metal band, so you can look them up. They're awesome. But that's not what I'm talking about. Um, um, it, 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 mortification means putting to death that which is sinful inside of me. Putting to death what is uh, sinful inside of me. Now, we're going to hang out in Colossians kind of the rest of the way here. Um, this is what Paul says. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. I, I, I say this with all the love in the world. Some of us have got little pet sins that kind of like favorite sins that, that we've got in and uh, we've just tried to tame them. We haven't tried to kill them. We've tried to tame them. We've tried to control them. Maybe it's a website. Maybe it's a substance. Maybe it's a, a relationship. Maybe it's a habit. And we've just tried to contain them. We've tried to put them on a leash. Maybe save it for a rainy day just in case, man, i got to rely on that again. But the scripture tells us, Paul tells us right here, no, nah, kill it. Put it to death. Put it to death. Uh, and here's, here's what I found. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff in our life that would be maybe not even, it'd be like morally, you know, just okay. It, it, it's just morally neutral. And, and we've got these things in our life, but we need to get rid of it. A lot of people ask this question, especially in the school with kids. They'll ask this question a lot. But, but adults as well, technically, is this a sin? Technically, could I get away with that? Is that okay? And I think that's just the lamest question ever. That's, that's not the question that we should be asking, really. It's like if I go to Maria and I say, hey, listen, what can I do? How far can I go before you would actually leave me? Because, like, I, I, wa I don't want to cross the line. I want to know. I want to come as close as I can to the line, but I don't want to cross the line, Right? So, first of all, that's not going to go well for anybody, right? We got to find those things out. But, but that's, that's kind of what we're saying. Really, the question is not, is it sin? The question is, does this help me run? The question is, does this help me become more like Jesus? Is this stirring up my affection for the Lord? That's the question that we ask. Uh, what do I need? Here's, here's a great question. What do I need to get rid of in order to get closer to Jesus, to become more like him. Those are the questions we should be asking. What, what sin is it that you're tolerating? What sin is it that you've kind of become comfortable with, that you've kind of just kind of normalized, well, that's my life and all that's forgiveness, and I'll put it away for a while, but, you know, I just want to, you know, totally do away. I don't want to totally kill it. What is that? We, we, and here's the thing. We can't just stop there. We just can't stop with killing sin. Uh, being good, doing that. That's like me saying, hey, I got this plot of land. Look, at, I'm, I'm going to make a garden here. And I get some Roundup and I kill all the weeds and I just leave it and I say, hey, come and look at my beautiful garden. And you're like, it's not a beautiful garden. You have a plot of land that has no weeds on it for right now. And you, we don't want to stop there. That's, that's not a garden. It's, it's just a, a plot of land with no weeds. Good starting place, okay? But that's not where we stop, which then brings us to the second word of the pur pur uh, Puritans, vivification, vivification, okay? Uh, V-I-V-ification, okay? So here's, here's the thing on that. This is uh, kind of the same area in, in Colossians. Here's, here's what Paul says. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind... On, on things above, not on earthly things. And in the same chapter, verse, tw uh, verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. This 
These are, these are the things that, that are happening. It's happening simultaneously in our life. Spiritual formation. We're displacing some things. We're dispossessing some other things. And then we're replacing them with the things of God. Contemplating on the glory of God. Thinking about God. What is stirring up my affections for God? Thinking about those things. It's, it's, uh, and you do that, you kill it with the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't just do it with sheer willpower. You do it in relationship, in godly gospel relationships. That's what you do. Uh, and, and so, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so what, all these things are happening in our life as we walk and as we're becoming more like him it, uh, simultaneously. It, it's not like workout day. I have an arm day, a leg day, a back day. No, these things are all happening all at the same time. 2 Corinthians says, here's one of the things. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. <coughs> it's not about just positional holiness. That's settled once and for all. It's about our practical holiness. It's about our participation with the living God. The story in the garden is really, it started with there was a belief. Uh, what did, what did, uh, and then there was an action. What did Satan say? Did God really say? And they begin to doubt, and they begin to think. And then, you know what? He, does, he doesn't want us to be like him. So, uh, so many of us are believing and bought into lies. We're just bought into the lies of the enemy. And, so we, and then we wonder why we don't see change in our life. Well, we have to start with our minds. We have to think on those things. we got to ponder the things of God. Now, again, this stuff takes time. Uh, it, it, it's sometimes, it, it's not just like up and to the right. You know, always a line, just, just like a rock. No, it's one step forward, two steps back. Two steps forward, one step back. It's, it, may, it probably looks like this for, for our lives. And you're like, man, I was going so good, and then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened, and all of a sudden, I just took a nosedive. I, I'm not even sure what happened, but it's like I, I lost all the ground that I gained. And so it, it, that, that's kind of what happens in our, our life. But it's a process. Trust the process. Uh, we, we should be asking questions like this of our life. Am I more loving this year than I was last year? Am I more patient? Am I more kind? Is there gentleness being observed in my life by me or by anybody else? Here, here's my encouragement. Don't measure your spiritual growth in weeks or months. Measure it in years or even decades. It's a process. Trust the process. Surrender yourself to the process. Those are the questions we should be asking. Charles Spurgeon said, uh, said, uh, once said, God uses people who fail because there aren't any other kind of people. He uses people that fail. So here's a little bit of how that looks. We have two opportunities, really. We have two. We can do our way. We can do God's way. With God, we, uh, on our own, we focus on me, mine, what's in it for me. With God, we focus on loving him, and loving people. On my own, there's guilt that produces shame. And, and I can't let anybody know about that. With God, guilt produces sorrow. And that leads to me seeking forgiveness. And not only that, but restoration with people. On my own, I hide my sin. With God, I expose it. Why would I want to hold on to that? What's it matter what somebody knows? God forgives me of it. I want to be clean of it. It entangles me anyway. It's just slowing me up. I need to expose it, bring it to the light. On my own, strength comes from my abilities. With God, strength comes from walking in step with His Spirit. So it's my abilities along with His abilities. Now, I don't want to just do it on my own. I need the power of the living God. And, and keep in mind, the Apostle Paul, he says, uh, listen, the, 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 the foolishness, uh, the cross is foolishness to the world. There's, there's going to be some real good fruitfulness and fruit bearing in your life. And to the world, there's going to be people that scoff at that. There's going to be people that don't recognize that at all. It's just the truth. So the question is, is transformation possible? Yeah, it's possible. It's just not inevitable. It's just not automatic. <clears throat> if you want to experience transformation, it takes a lifelong commitment, a long obedience in the same direction as Eugene Peterson put it. I love it, put that way. Long obedience in the same direction. Most of us 
know that, you know, intimacy with humans, it, it takes intentionality. It's the same thing with the Lord. Our intimacy with Him takes intentionality. We can't just drift into it. You can't autopilot your way to transformation. I wish you could. It'd be so much easier. But transformation is what He invited us into. That's what it is, not just to say a prayer, do some religious things, and just be the same old person you always were. But so, so, sometimes we settle for that. We settle so, for so much less than what he has for us. Father is for us. And he wants flourishing and freedom and abundance and joy. That's what he's holding out to us. That's what he wants. Ah, you know what? I'll do it my way. So many times. Why wouldn't we just abandon ourselves to that? Listen, our theology is only as good as the love that it produces. That's a reality. It doesn't matter how many things we know. Our theology is only as good as the love it produces. Let's be known as a people that are becoming more and more like Jesus. People who love really well. People who extend grace to other people, like the grace that they have received from God. Experiencing more and more peace and joy and His presence in our life. So maybe this next week, a question for you to ask yourself is, who am I becoming? Who am I becoming? Maybe if you want to be really bold, you ask your spouse or a close friend that you trust in a small group or, or your kids. Then you re might really be able to find out who you're becoming. What would it look like for, look like for us to, to be close enough to each other that in our small groups, we don't just say, hey, how you doing? No. We say, man, what's God doing in your life? Where is God at work in your life right now? What would it look like if we did, 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 just started uh, new generational patterns? Started, you know, we're going to reverse the curse. New generational patterns in our life. Who is God forming you to be? One of my greatest fears is that I can be a successful pastor, but then a failure as a husband, as a father, as a Christ follower. It's possible to, to do that. You, you have a Father in heaven, cheering you on, encouraging you, drawing you close to Him. You have a Father doing that. I'm going to end with this, then we're going to share in the Lord's table. It's a quote from Kevin DeYoung, and it just captures this idea of we've got a Father who's cheering us on. He says, the Bible is realistic about holiness. Don't think that all this glorious talk about dying to sin and, uh, uh, and living uh, to God means that there will be no struggles anymore or that sin won't show up in a believer's life. The Christian life still entails obedience. It still involves a fight, but it's a fight you're going to win. You have the spirit of Christ in your corner, rubbing your shoulders, holding the bucket, putting his arm around you saying, uh, before the next round, you're going to knock, knock him out. You're going to knock him out, kid. Sin may get some jabs in. It may clean your clock once in a while. It may bring you to your knees. But if you are in Christ, it will never knock you out. You are no longer a slave, but free. Sin has no dominion over you. It can't. It won't. A new king sits on the throne. You serve a different master. And you salute a different Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you come alongside us. I thank you that in the midst of a, a crazy, mixed up culture and world, that you would say, come with me. Be with me. I am Emmanuel. I'm God with you. Let's, let's do this together. And you do life with us. And you'd empower us by your spirit. So, Father, I'm asking that this year, 2024, you'd help us to simplify and to recognize, uh, be with you. Lord, help us to ask the question, what can I get rid of just to get closer to God and experience Him in this new way so that I can walk in freedom, so that I can be a difference maker in this world, so I can do what my designer has called me to do. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hey, if you guys would stand with me, we're going to share the Lord's table today. The band's going to sing, uh, and, and so we're going to do we've done a, a couple other times. There are, are different uh, trays set up, uh, up front, off on the side. So when you're ready, 
um, go, get your elements, and then just come back. You wanna, if you want to come to the altar, you can come to the altar. If you want to go back to your seat, if you want to kneel at your seat, you want to sit there, you want to stand, whatever you want, we're going we're gonna to share it in the Lord's table, but we're going to do it at our own speed. We're going to do it at, at, uh, when we're ready, and, and just um, we're going to practice being with Jesus. We're going to practice hearing him. We're going to uh, uh, do, do real life practice. And so um, that's what we're going to do. So as, as the band sings, you can sing along and worship with them. But just come, partake, get the, the, the bread, the cracker, get the juice, and then go. Be in the presence of Jesus. The, the reality is he's here. He's here in, in the communion, in the table. The Lord's here. So just be with him. Thank him that we can share in this. Thank him that he sees you as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Examine yourself. Man, I'm, I'm the most blessed person in all the world that God would do this for me. So the band's going to sing, come and partake of that, and I'll come up and close us out. Still 